tonight's talk on the Rio Frio Ar Regional Archaeological Project. I did my first field school during my graduate program in a cave in Louisa in Puerto Rico. So I'm really thrilled to get back to cave archaeology and hear about Dr. Spinard's work on the Maya tonight. And I'll let Natalie introduce our speaker in a few minutes. But first, let me share a few announcements with you all. The newsletter deadline for submissions is Friday, October 30th. You have over a month to get content together and send it in to our newsletter chair, Marla Neary. Uh, the art show submission date just passed on Sunday, and we have lots of neat pieces included in the show this year. Uh, the judging will occur this coming week, and the show runs digitally on the SBCAS website from October 2nd through December 31st of this year. Please check the art show tab on the website to vote for the People Choice Awards uh, between October 2nd and the 16th. Ark in the Park preparations are in full swing with less than a month away from the virtual event on Saturday, October 17th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. We can still accept content if you would like to contribute to the event. Please check out our social media pages and website for more information and share the event far and wide. It's digital, so anyone anywhere can join us and, and see our event. So are you interested in being part of our board? Uh, now is the time to contact myself or the Vice President, Rachel Bilchek, about how you would like to be involved. Uh, we will be voting on elected positions in about a month. You could also be on the board by being involved in some of, some of our committees. Uh, there's Art Show Committee, which right now, you know, we'll be judging uh, the pieces that come in from the Art Show. There's Sales, Environmental Review, uh, Arc in the Park, Climate Change, Student Liaison, Youth and Community, or the Newsletter. So those are all committees and it's, um, you don't need to be elected for this position. We, we would love more help. Um, please keep checking our website and social media for SDCAS news and information on the monthly virtual lectures. These have been really great. Our attendance is uh, better than ever on these virtual lectures because people can join from all over the place. It's wonderful. Um, do any of the other board members have a brief comment before Natalie takes over? Well, I do have a comment. I just saw a question from Ryan who says, I'm still a student. Can I still get involved with the Archaeological Society? Oh, you bet you can, Ryan. So um, go ahead and reach out to me. Um, I'm the one who sent you the email for uh, tonight's, um, tonight's meeting. So you can go ahead and just uh, put your inquiry in uh, with that email. Okay. Oh, great. Okay, okay, cool, great. Anyone else? Any other announcements? All right, take it away, Natalie. Oh, wait, sorry, I had oh. one. Oh, Shannon. Our art show will be available, uh, the art and archaeology art show will be available on our website starting October 2nd to the end of the year. So head over to our website to view a lot of great art. Awesome, thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> okay, thanks, Natalie. Uh, so before I introduce Dr. Spinard tonight, just a quick note about November, no, next month is October. And so next month we're going to have the, the, mm, our usual duo of uh, Karen Lacey and Sandra Pentney giving a, a, a Halloween themed talk. Um, for our October meeting. Um, so keep an eye out for that in October. And I'm still looking for somebody for November if anybody has any ideas about someone else who wants to wants to uh, give a talk to us. And um, I think we'll just go ahead and get started. And this is being recorded, just side note, because I already told Dr. Spinar that it is being recorded so you can watch it later and see all of our faces again later on. So, Dr. Spinard, who I've never actually met, so it's nice to see your face finally. Uh, we've just been sending emails back and forth. And is the, one of the assistant professors of anthropology at CSU San Marcos. And he's been working in the Maya region for over 20 years. And since 2018 has been directing the Rio Frio Regional Archaeological Project in Central Belize. And um, with that, I'm going to let you go ahead, Dr. Spinard. 
I'll let you share your screen. Go ahead. Great. Right. Everybody hear me okay? Okay. Yes. Let's see. Um... Before you get before you get started, if you have questions, um, I will be monitoring the questions in the chat. So if you want to ask a question, um, you can save it till till the end, um, or type it in as you think of it, and we'll we'll try to answer some some questions at the end. So I'll be watching the chat. All right. Um, well, thank you, Natalie, um, and thanks to the society for having me out here. Um, this is something that I've, I've actually been, uh, an opportunity I've been looking forward to since I started at Cal State San Marcos. So I'm glad we were able to finally connect and, and, um, and have this talk. So um, just, to, just to let you all know, I have, um, I'm going to be switching back and forth between PowerPoint and some other media and, and stuff that I have for this talk. Um, so it, it might get a little complicated and um, just, uh, but it should be fun. <laughs> So um, I'm going to be talking to you all tonight about, um, I realize I didn't put this in my title, but the Maya sacred landscapes, the Rio Frio, Rio Frio region in Cayo, Belize. Um, and um, I also want to say, actually, before I, before I start, I see a lot of familiar faces, students and family, um, former students as well. So thank you all for coming, coming out and, and sharing uh, your evenings with me. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to, uh, before I start, um, or while I get started, what I want to first is do is, is to thank my team, um, whose work is, is really reflected in this talk. And, and for those of you, and I think everybody here is in California, archaeology right now, I had a few people from Belize who might show up. Um, these might be some familiar faces to you all. Um, Andres Berdeja, Mike Miro, uh, um, Jesse Garcia, and um, Ariana Yanez, who are, who are my team, and, and Joel Aspetita as well, who helped start this project with me back in 2018. Um, so the conversations I've had with them and the work that they've done are certainly reflected in this talk. So I don't want to take full credit for, for everything here. Um, and I also uh, want to point out too um, that this research is conducted with permission from the Belize Institute of, Institute of Archaeology and the Belize Forest Department. Um, and so uh, this, the, um, the project area is in a, a wildlife preserve. Um, and so I, I couldn't do this research without their permission. So I also want to thank them for, for their permission to do this, to do this research. All right. So um, my project is the Rio Frio Regional Archaeological Project, or as I like to call it, Rift Wrap. <laughs> um, uh, um, it's an intended pun there with the Rift Wrap. Um, um, but so I'll talk more about the more about the Rio Frio region, but I, I realize that that many of you aren't Mayanists. So what I want to do is really quickly is is talk a little bit about the geography and the chronology of the Maya area um, before before we get going, or before I start talking about my research. Okay, um, this is the Maya region, um, so Central Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, and El Salvador, and we really can divide this up. Uh, into three separate areas. We've got the northern area up here. And can everybody see my cursor? Yeah, okay. Um, so northern area up here. Uh, this is primarily, uh, this is this this whole area right here, this, this green area and this slight orange area was seabed floor back uh, during the Jurassic period. So this is all limestone primarily. But the, the um, geology here is different between these two areas. Here in the northern area, um, it, we don't, all the water actually flows underground through underground cave systems. Um, and we see uh, this is a different culture area, uh, a later, later fluorescence up here, and I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. The area that I'm going to focus on is, is the central area here. And you can see there's a bit more topography here, but it is all limestone, um, except for this, this area, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And then, oops. You have the southern area, which are volcanic highlands, and basically have a couple of tectonic plates colliding here, so creating a lot of uh, geologic geologic uplift in this in this area. So the the highlands are very different uh, geographically and geo geologically from from the lowlands, and this does, did play an important part in uh, in Maya society. And, and I won't get into that tonight, but uh, we do see uh, we do see important resources only in, found in the highlands, um, and that leads to extensive trade networks and things like that. Um, 
what we do find because this is limestone here in the in the in the lowlands is we find a lot of caves uh, and, and cave systems and, and and so i'll talk about that again coming up in, in just a few minutes we don't have very many caves in the highland just because of the geography the geology there is different all right so I'm just going to talk about um, again, just to, to sort of give us a frame of reference here. Um, just talk about chronology a little bit, um, and these are really, really broad strokes um, that uh, I'm not going to go into great detail here. But uh, we get the pre-classic period, which uh, is from about 1200 BC to about 250 CE, and this is the first where we see the first villages very early around 1200 BC, and the area that I'm working in actually has some of the earliest villages in the Maya region. Uh, the great the, the larger region I'm working in. And I'll talk about that in, in just a few minutes. Uh, very over the next couple of hundred years we see the, the origins of the first cities and we see the, the, the groundwork laid for divine kingship during this this period. The classic period is the cultural fluorescence of the central area. Uh, and this this is a period that's really just it's, it's somewhat culturally defined, but it's largely defined based on the presence of carved stone monuments or stela that have a, a long count calendar on it. And the long count calendar is a, basically, it's just a count of days since the Maya creation event happened. And so they're recording, their monuments are historical. So this is, this is the, um, the period where they're, they're writing, down, writing down their history in, in, this, in a long weighted form. There is some writing in the pre-classic period, but it's, it's very, uh, there's, there's not a lot of it. Um, and, it and it's, really hyper-regional. So we see the writing system developing during that time. Now this is the period that I'll be focusing on for the talk. So I want to talk about this, break these down into the different periods here a little bit more. Oops. Oh, I guess I didn't put my early, my early classic slide in there. Um, the early classic is, is um, where we see sort of, uh, we see a lot of influence from central Mexico in this region um, and sort of the full full spread of, of Maya kingship and, and the cities start growing in population uh, and um, it's, it's sort of this, this transitional period between when kingship first arises until we see sort of um, uh, sort of the, these, these social political systems become, become solidified. The late classic period from 550 to 800, uh, what we see here during this period, especially the last 200 years or so, is the largest populations, the height of artistic achievement, massive temples like you see here. Um, you can see here is my department chair halfway up the pyramid here and here's some people at the very top and then there's still a few pyramids up on top of here. So these are massive, massive buildings. So we get the height of artistic achievement, great prosperity, um, but it also comes to be a time of, of social and political unrest and we start to see more warfare become much more prominent in the hieroglyphic inscriptions during this time. And that leads us to the to the um, terminal classic or terminal classic period, which is sort of the traditional collapse. What, what people think about when they think of the collapse. We see political instability, climate insecurity, overpopulation, and eventual abandonment of settlements throughout throughout the central area. There's some residual populations, but we see a, a large depopulation in the central area at that time. And then post-classic period, we see a re reorganization of society and, and cultural fluorescence up in the north area. So if you've been to Chichen Itza, Mayapan, Tulum, places like that, this is sort of when these places take off. We also see the emergence of territorial polities in the northern area, and right just before the Spanish show up too, we start to see, we start to see uh, territorial polities develop in the highlands as well. <clears throat> okay, so most people know the Maya for these large buildings, right? for these, these, these massive temples. Um, it's beautiful architecture, their, their art, right? but caves are also a vital component of, of their lives. And so what I want to do now is talk a little bit about the importance of caves in Maya, Maya society and Maya worldview to understand uh, some context to why why these caves were being used. So caves were homes of earth forces, particularly rain and wind were thought to come from caves. They're places of ancestral emergence and places where the ancestors went to after they after they died. 
And they're also places of, because they're, because the wind and rains come from there, they're, they're also places of agricultural fertility. And so we see these, these motifs depicted in, in Maya art. Uh, this is a, an example of a stucco statue in the mouth of, in the mouth of a cave in, in Guatemala um, that, was, that was recorded in the 1970s. And it's actually a seeded rain god sitting in the mouth of the cave. So this is saying that these, these are places where rain, the rain god lives. Um, here, this is a very early, this is a um, late pre-classic mural uh, that depicts a cave of creation. So here is the cave mouth. It's, it's, um, it's really stylized, but here it's, is its stalagmite tooth right here. And here's its eye. And the scene that's coming out of it, you see this long serpent, uh, this long floor coming out of it, and these spirals right here. This is breath. This is, this is the cave breathing life out into the universe. And this, this scene here, and there's, there's more of it, this is a really long mural here, but the, the scene depicts the emergence, the, the creation of the world and the emergence of the four ancestral couples. So we see caves, again, being places of, of rain and places of, of ancestors. What, we've also, what we also see too is that cave formations themselves seem to be thought of as rain gods themselves or, or physical manifestations of the rain gods. Right? So we see oftentimes cave formations carved with these really simple faces on them. So here an eye, an eye, and a mouth on this cave formation. Of course cave formations drip. Right? And so this is, this is cave, it rains inside the caves. Right? So we typically find these really simple faces in, uh, in places that are that that have water that have water in the caves, whether they're dripping or they're um, in underground water sources. A colleague of mine uh, who worked up in up, uh, the Yucatan area actually was investigating post-classic period rain shrines, and he found cave formations were a common uh, inclusion in the in the constructions themselves. So again, making some kind of connection with the between rain and these cave formations. Uh, this here is a petroglyph panel, and I'll, I'll show you this more in a, in a few minutes, from a cave that I worked on for my dissertation. And there's no water in this cave, but we were here during the rainy, uh, during a time of rain, and it turns out that water flows down the back of this formation here. You can see where the green stops right here. The cave's got a crack in the ceiling and the water just flows down and drips down here and collects actually in a pool underneath whenever it rains. So again, we get these simple carved faces with with these, um, with these kinds of formations, with these dripstone formations. And now this is going to be where I'm going to stop really quickly and bring over my first media. And this is a 3D model that that we that uh, my team made of the of this formation. And we zoom in here, we can actually see a face here, eye, eye, mouth. Another one here, eye, eye, mouth. This one actually was recently chopped by a machete. Here, eye, eye, mouth. This one's also been a little bit destroyed as well. So the mouth here um, was, was elongated. This one we actually found by looking at this model. There's deep grooves in the formation here. Is an eye, an eye, and a sad face. You can see that how deep those grooves get. Eye, eye, sad face. <clears throat> so this this formation too is covered in these simple faces, right? And and so it's another. It's it's more um, it, there. And again, it's, it's tied to flowing water. Here, eye, eye, and a crooked mouth. Um, two, just because I have this here, and, and hopefully you can make it out. We didn't see this until, until again, looking at the model. But you can make out a, a circular object here. Follow this down like this. Comes to a ball. Here, comes down. And there's this element here, this curved element right here, 
as well, but you follow that down. So that may be connected to this, we're not really sure. It doesn't look like it in person. But to a V shape here, comes back up to here, over to here, another ball. This is a, a either a spider monkey like this, with its hands up above, or we see those round, those round balls um, used in ritual boxing. Um, Maya boxers actually held balls in their hands and they put helmets on um, that could look kind of like this. And they would, they would punch each other with rocks until they bled and that would be a way of offering, making uh, a rain offering. So it's, it's not, having this be a boxer is not out of the question for it being related to rain ritual as well. So this may have been a place where people were actually rain boxing perhaps, or this is a spider monkey, uh, which would make sense um, because it's out at the mouth of the cave and well, spider monkeys inhabit this area as I can tell you from personal experience and, and all the sticks and rocks that have been thrown at me by them. <laughs> all right. So we get, we get this association with these simple faces and, and water. Right? So, but why, why did Maya people associate caves with rain? Well, this is, this is, uh, it's simple observational science. Um, and I, I will bring this back over here again really quickly. Because of, because of the limestone bedrock, the water is constantly flowing into and out of the caves. So you got cave waterfall. Seasonal creeks, seasonal streams. We get water flowing in and out of the landscape here, in and out of the mouths of caves, coming out of the ground through springs as well. And so this, what, from, from an observational standpoint, an observational scientific standpoint, the cave, the, the landscape is filled with water and hills are filled with water and caves are ways to access that water. So we're not gonna watch all of that here. I got a lot more to show you to show you all. <clears throat> so these, the, the, the water is flowing in and out of the landscape. Right? We also see that because the caves are typically cooler than the outside tropical air, when especially in the mornings and the evenings, when the tropical air cool the, the warm tropical air it's the cool tropical or the cool wet air of the cave, clouds form. Okay, so we get clouds forming at cave entrances. We get water flowing in and out of caves. Again, here's, um, here's more water. This is one of the caves I work in, right? Water flowing in and out of the caves. And so, so it makes sense that caves are places where the rains come from, where, where, where water comes from. And Two, an observation that I made during this day was that sometimes when it's raining outside, it's raining inside the cave. It had been raining for about two days and, and any other time I had been in this cave, it was completely dry. But after a day of rain, the rain, the rain is soaking through the bedrock and it's raining in the cave. And so all those formations that form in the, in the roof of caves are forming because of flowing water. Now, the Maya were going in these during, throughout the year, in the caves throughout the year. I'm only down there typically during the dry season, so it's unusual for me to see what the, those environments are like when they're wet. But you know, the few days of rain that I've, or I've experienced a lot of rain down there, but heavy, heavy rains, the kind they get in the wet season, it completely transforms the caves and cave environments and it allows us to, to really understand why this perception is that it that rain comes from the caves because they're filled with water, they rain inside them, and they, they produce clouds, they blow out clouds. So we have this connection with rain and water, or rain and caves. And we also know that, that caves were important long long distance pilgrimage destinations. This is a hieroglyphic text painted on a, a wall from a cave in Guatemala called Nachtunich. 
and this text record it talks about multiple rulers from surrounding sites actually coming to that cave to perform a particular ritual uh, political political ritual here. Right. Um, and so we know that they were the uh, the sites are are Karakol and um, and Ishkun, if, if anybody is familiar with the Maya area here, they're coming from, from, from several kilometers away to come to this cave and meeting up in the Karakol and Ishkun are, are um, just about 60 kilometers away from each other. So they're making this long distance pilgrimage destination in, in, to this cave to perform an important ritual here. And of course, um, there's the sacred cenote at Chichen Itza, which today, for many people, it's still a, a pilgrimage destination, and it was in the past. It was actually um, the cenote was dredged in the 1800s, and they found artifacts coming as far away as, as Costa Rica, uh, found in there. And so this is this was always a long distance pilgrimage destination, not just for Maya people, but people throughout Mesoamerica and, and Central America as well. Okay, so with, with that background, um, I want to go back to Belize, and talk a little bit more about. Um, Talk a little bit more about talk about Belize. Um, so, the country can geographically be divided, geologically be divided up into two two sections. Um, you get northern Belize, which is there's it's all limestone bedrock, but very little cave formation. Um, it's just the, the nature of the, the limestone there. Southern Belize, on the other hand, is is dominated by the Maya Mountains, which is all this area down down here, and it does extend into Guatemala, uh, but we're just going to be talking about Belize today. Um, this is actually, a, a, it's primarily an uplifted limestone block due to tectonic faulting, except there's three major granitic upwellings in there. Um, this being the largest one here, and this is actually my, my research area. <clears throat> now, throughout most of the country, the, um, you see broadleaf tropical forests being uh, uh, sort of covering, covering the country. Oh, forgot to say down here um, where the tectonic faults are, there's the northern boundary fault here, and then there's a southern boundary fault down over here. There's probably another one that hasn't been identified yet on the east, and another that's deeply buried under sediment on the west. And because of the because of the uplift here and all the runoff when this when the sea sea drained sea floor drained from here, um, this we get vast vast cave systems in this in this area throughout the Mayan mountains. Right? Okay, so we get tropical broadleaf tropical forest, and this is this is what the what the jungle looks like, right? And this is this is what most of the country would have would have looked like. And of course, there's people living there today. There's farms and and, and towns and, and um, cities as well. So it's it's not all jungle anymore. So, but what I want to do now is is bring your bring your attention to this oval. Right here, the oval shaped area, because this is where my project's located. Okay. And that is, you can see how, uh, this is one of those granitic uplands, the largest in Belize, and you can see just how much it sticks out from this satellite image here. It's, it's a very different landscape than the rest of, of, of Belize. Right? Um, and this is, this whole area here is the Mountain Pine Ridge Forest Reserve. Right? And it's, it's, like I said, it's a very different, very different landscape. Now, the soils there are very different. Um, they're not with the, the um, because it's granite, they're actually, um, they're very sandy and acidic. And so tropical forest doesn't grow there. Instead, we get a very different type of, type of um, forest, which I'll talk about in a minute. But what, what I wanted to show you here is that because the soils are, because of the acidity of the soils, Maya people didn't settle up here. And so we get, the surrounding region, these are just some of the major sites in the area. There's, there's smaller settlements throughout, throughout here. But we get large settlements in the tropical forest, tropical broadleaf forest, but nothing, nothing up here. And really because of that, the, this region, the Mountain Pine Ridge and the Pine Ridge Reserve itself have actually been largely ignored by archaeology because there's, 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 there's not much up here. So we get we do get settlement, but there's no, you know, there's no settlement up here. And just all these, these lines here are the different rivers and creeks flowing off of the mountain pine ridge. 
Now in the reserve, we get two primary ecozones. This is the this is the McCall River. This is the major river that's flowing out um, out of the from around the Pine Ridge. It basically circum, um, uh, circumvents the, the Pine Ridge. It flows around it, except all along the western boundary of the Pine Ridge here, there's all these residual, basically large limestone islands uh, that, geologically speaking, um, that 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 got cut off from the rest of the plateau over here. So there is some tropical forest, broadleaf forest here with limestone bedrock, but for the most part, we get um, uh, this granitic, this granitic uh, soil here. So over here, we do get broadleaf forest, but for the most part, everything else over here is broadleaf, broadleaf forest. And this is what it looks like. Very, very different than, than tropical jungle. It's, it's really scrub pine. Um, and there's a lot of streams and waterfalls, uh, granite, granite waterfalls here. <clears throat> right, so what I want to do now is, is focus on the broadleaf forest areas because that is where my project is, is located. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, I'll talk about five caves here, um, but really I'm only going to talk about three of them, uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so there's Domingo Ruiz Cave, Rio Frio Cave A, which is known in Belize as Twin Cave, a Rio Frio B, which is literally right across the street is, uh, from it, it's about 200 meters away, is, is the other Twin Cave. Uh, Rio Frio C is the Rio Frio Cave, as, as forests of Belize know it, and, and people and folks of Belize know it. And then there's Rio Frio Cave E, which is, uh, I won't be talking about that tonight, except to say that um, I've, I've been wildly unsuccessful in my attempts to relocate where that site is. <laughs> right. um, the Rio Frio Caves, A, B, and C, those are really exciting names. Um, they were named that by, um, by uh, Gregory Mason, who first reported them. In 1928, and I'll, I'll talk about him here in just a few minutes. But he's the one who um, who named them, um, and um, so that's where those names come from. Okay, so I'll start with Domingo Ruiz Cave, which was named after a forester named Domingo Ruiz, who discovered it on accident. While um, I haven't been able to get the story down, but he discovered it from uh, while fleeing some kind of calamity, whether it be a fire. Um, a, a miss, miss, uh, a possible invasion of Guatemalans, rumors of invasions from Guatemala, um, or some other some other catastrophe like that, or fleeing a hurricane. All right. So here is Domingo Ruiz Cave, and the entrance here is really um, it's it's basically a, a a collapse into the hillside, and so you climb down here, and the first thing you notice when you walk in is that there is walls everywhere. Now these walls here are, um, they are in the very back of the cave. This is actually not very tall here. It's only, a, it's maybe about a foot, foot and a half tall or so. And right behind this, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, the floor drops off about 20 feet behind here. So there doesn't seem to be any purpose to this wall. Um, but these, we see these kinds of things throughout the entrance here. Now going into the cave, you drop down here and there's actually several uh, terraces, a natural step that my people built into the cave here and you make your way down. And this is the drop behind that wall that I showed you at the entrance here. So it doesn't look very like very much yet, but if you dim the lights a little bit, <clears throat> what you see is that this wall seems to be act these walls, this one's blocked over here too, seems to be acting as some sort of um, a shade, a, a, a sun blind for to make this this chamber darker down here. And this is this is a, what I'm starting to see down in this area is is a lot of shadow play like this and, and interest in, in manipulating light through different kinds of constructions and different kinds of cave modifications down here. So um, I'm this is Okay. Still, still looking for this, but this seems to be a, a, an area that my people spend a lot of time, uh, a, a type of cave modification my people spend a lot of time doing in these in these caves. 
Now across, right across from the entrance is another wall right here. And <clears throat> it's, about, it's about a meter tall and it doesn't fill in this, it never filled in this, this area here. So I'm not really sure what it's for yet, um, but it does seem to be delineating the space in front of it and the space behind it. This area behind it is actually really, it's a small chamber where you can kind of walk around and uh, crouching. The soil is different back here. And so there seem to, they seem to be closing this area off back here for some reason. And there's a few artifacts on the surface and, and we excavated back there and only found a few snail shells, river snail shells that were brought in. And, and those are common for, for uh, to be found in caves and cave contexts. And a few unidentifiable pieces of unidentifiable pieces of ceramic, and so uh, there didn't seem to be much happening back there. But they closed it off for again for some reason. Now continuing into the cave, um, the, the it's it's a long tunnel, basically, uh, um, and so you can see here, um, this is this is basically the character of the cave right here. And we did put an excavation unit in about halfway into the cave because there was an ash lens here and I wanted to, um, nobody investigated this cave before, so trying to learn some of the chronology here. And we excavated down about three or five centimeters or so and then instantly hit this orange soil down here. And this orange soil is typically affiliated, uh, associated with Pleistocene, so Ice Age soils, um, and, and it's common in caves throughout, throughout the Maya area. We didn't find much on the surface, but we actually did find several centimeters down into the transition into this Pleistocene soil. We actually did find some possible undulate teeth, and we found a few small fragments of highly polished bone, a scapula of a medium-sized mammal, and um, and in addition to the polish, a few of them looks like looked like they had cut marks on them in Pleistocene soil, possible Pleistocene soil. So um, we're, unfortunately, I packed these up for export. Last time I was down in Belize and then COVID struck. And now I'm still waiting <laughs> to find out um, if these are actually Pleistocene and if, and if I have some early Americas um, material in, the, in this cave, if we have some early, early Americas, American material in the cave. All right, so let's get to the good stuff. Um, Gregory Mason was not that people in America's is um, but some of the some of the, the bigger, more exciting caves. Um, the the Rio Frio caves A, B, and C were first documented by Gregory Mason, who was a journalist, an amateur archaeologist, and just kind of an early 1900s explorer. Uh, he went on several expeditions for the uh, different museums and in, uh, in, in uh, on the East Coast. And one of them, uh, he went uh, in 1928, he was funded by um, uh, a gentleman named Blodgett, who, um, and so they had the Mason Blodgett expedition, who went down to the Maya area um, to collect ethnographic materials for the High Museum, High Foundation, Museum of American Indian, now uh, part of the Smithsonian in New York. And so while he was, while he was well, in Belize, he heard about um, some cave that somebody had found way deep in the in the bush, and um, he paid paid got a crew and, and went down and, and he he recorded caves A, B, and C. Now, unfortunately, he wasn't a good archaeologist. Um, he, he was an amateur archaeologist. He was an explorer. He was looking for museum quality artifacts, and so he has one report that is that big about the size of an index card, right? Um, and that was it. That was, that's, that was his write-up of, of his excavations here. There's no maps. There's no context to anything outside of what cave that they were found in. Um, and he's, he, did, he did provide photographs, but the photographs, as you'll see here in, in just a minute, are not very good. <clears throat> but he does provide some descriptions of the caves that, I, um, um, that, that make them sound exciting and, and um, part of the reason I wanted to work down here is because um, because of his descriptions and, and trying to see if he was full of it or just kind of make himself 
he's a super explorer, right? Cave B, he doesn't spend he he doesn't spend any time with. Uh, he just says that it's a it's the wide mouth variety is the smallest of the three in this group, has no water supply, and you lose only common ruptured without uh, design. That's it. That's his description of, of cave B. Um, and, and he's pretty pretty much spot on with that. It's not a very big cave, but I'll, but I'll show you that in just a minute. Uh, cave A, he talks about it being just a little bit further away, and he describes it as um, having a large entrance. Uh, uh, the cave is cut into the, into the, into the bedrock. Um, there's a large wall at the entrance of it that probably protected people from who were living inside from boulders falling into it. Um, and, but then he talks about a column that he thought might have been created by the Maya, maybe not, but it looked to him, as he says, uh, it seems at first to be the work of man, and I examined it several times before coming to the fixed conclusion that it is not. Its artificial appearance is increased by the fact that low down on its face, which looks out over this cathedral, which is a, a chamber he describes, is an opening like a mouth with what appear to be upper and lower teeth. I thought this was the open mouth of a typical Maya stone serpent, but I am convinced that these teeth are merely small stalactites and stalagmites, although res the resemblance to the serpent's jaw is astounding. And so he says there's a massive serpent in the middle of the cave and it may or may not be, um, it may or may not be um, man-made. Um, and then he talks about Cave C as, as this really massive, massive entrance. Um, he says it's as open, wide and high at each end, and illuminated by daylight throughout the nearly 400 yards of its length. It has an air of a well-proportioned spaciousness, suggesting a huge Gothic cathedral. And so he's describing this massive, massive cave down here. Right? In there, he talks about um, some architectural elements and that he excavated and there's, there's pottery everywhere. In fact, he says you can't go in there without stepping on, uh, stepping on the pottery and breaking it. It's so, it's, it's, it's so common there. So I'm just going to flip through these real quick. Um, these are some of the pictures that he that he provides in his in his report. As you can see, the quality is not very good, so you can't really make out a lot of the information. But one of them, at least, is on display in New York, and um, Joel uh, had uh, gone there. One of my crew had gone there and and saw it and took this picture for me. Um, but this is this is a pot that I'm able to to now give some chronology here. I think this pot tells us that the cave was used between 550 to 700. There's some jars and sensors here that date to the late, late classic period, so 700 to 900. So this gets late to terminal classic period. Right? Lots of different types of bowls from really, really crude sandy wares to really nice, what seem to be a, a common type. And several shirts right, like this down here and I was just actually I just got from the Smithsonian photographs of, and records of, of these materials yesterday I haven't had a chance to look through them and but they they've given me better pictures of these and these actually look like they might be um, early late classic period sensors fragments so we're looking at again about 550 to 700 here and also in those in those materials from the Smithsonian I just got yesterday turns out that there's some early classic period ceramics in here too so in his material that he collected. So we're looking at a use of this cave from about somewhere starting around 250 up until at least 900, maybe up into about 1,000. So the entire classic period is when this cave was being used. Or these caves, these caves are being used. Um, <clears throat> what I want to do now is take you on a tour of these of these caves. So as we are standing in front here, this is the cave Mason describes as, as walking up and it's a big gash in the in the in the hill. You can see here, look around. And it's like he described the big gash in the hill. And it's definitely jungle. Now, as we go down into the cave, oops, that's what I was afraid was going to happen. 
Give me one second. Oops. There we go. As we go down into it, this is actually the wall right here that he mentions. And let's see, where did my wall go? This is the entrance down into the cave, and it's really narrow. It's actually about shoulder width. But this is the wall that he talks about in there. And it's massive. This block itself, I, I haven't excavated this yet, but this block is about as big as I am. So we're looking at several hundred pounds of, of rock here built into the, into the cave here. We can descend into the cave and look back up at that entrance there. And this is not, this is not the, best, the best image of this here, but if we, um, the wall basically does like the wall in Domingo Ruiz did, it blocks a lot of the light off from what would otherwise be a very large open entrance. So bring this back here really quickly. This is, this is about, I'm standing on the ground and this is, and my camera's pointing straight. So this is about uh, two meters tall, about six feet tall. Oops. So this is, they're blocking off at least six feet of the, of the entrance here. And that would have significantly darkened this interior chamber here. Now, what's also, why they're also doing that is that there's a couple windows, natural windows here, and I'm actually standing in front of the other one here, that were also filled up. At least half of me is standing in front of, the, in front of it there. Um, so they're, they're, they're trying to darken the, darken the entrance here. And so we can go down into what Mason called the cathedral. And you can see why he called it the cathedral. It's this, this huge, huge ceiling here. And these are right here. And there's another one over here. You can't see in this picture. These are the these are the blocked uh, the blocked windows. So they're blocking the entrance, and they're blocking this these up too. And these have been knocked out before Mason was there. But they block these out to actually block the sunlight to make the cathedral what Mason's calling the cathedral completely dark. Now he talks about this chamber having several stories. Uh, so there's a first, a second story and a third story. And if we look up here, this actually is, he's, he's, he's right, that there's this, this massive ledge over here that leads to the rest of the cave. And so we'll climb up there. And now we're looking down at the cathedral down below. And here, there we go, there we go. Here's the column that he talks about. So it doesn't look like very much here. But this is the visage that he was talking about with the teeth. Um, that's okay. We're gonna we're we're having a little technical difficulty with this one here, um, but That one's not going to work. So there's the column. And here is, we passed a light through the column where he's talking about where the teeth are broken at. Um, and these are the, the slagmites and the stalactites that he's talking about. And we did look at these a little bit closer. And it turns out that they were, they were broken in antiquity. We can tell that because they've slightly regrown over, over the course of time. Now, imagine, right, this is looking down into the cathedral down below. Right? And so 
the Maya would have been in here with torchlight. Now, people looking up to whatever actions were happening up above on this ledge up here would have seen this visage in the shadow on the wall, flickering in the in the torchlight, right? looking like it's striking and and and, and moving, and it's it's this animate it's this animate thing, right? And it's it's the it's it's bringing this ritual to life, and and so Mason actually wasn't necessarily wrong when you talked about it being a Maya serpent or something like that. He's actually he was right. He just didn't realize that it was actually modified, and that they're they're intentionally they've created this to make it look like this this monster essentially that would have been um, participating in the ritual or perhaps it was who was conjured during the ritual. Right. This is this, maybe the the, the, some kind of one of the essences that live in the caves. So we can go back. There's the, there's the column again, looking down in the cathedral. The cave gets really complicated back here and there's ceramics everywhere. But what I want to do is bring you to the very back of the cave. Because here, the very bottom, is a creek that runs through the cave here. And some of these jars, these bowls that Mason found, were actually embedded in the limestone back here underneath the, underneath the creek. And, and so it seems that um, they were coming all the way back here and probably making rain offerings or water offerings back here, burning incense. These are, these are used for burning incense um, uh, throughout, throughout my history, really. Um, bowls like, just like this would dredge from the cenote of sacrifice up in Chichen Itza, filled, overflowing with, with, with incense. And so we know that these were used for burning incense, and Mason finds these back here. So it's likely they're, they're coming back here to perform rain rituals. So I had, I had a little bit of sound of, of the creek, but um, we're running out of time, and it got lost on my computer. So um, we will exit the cave. Go back to the cathedral. It's a lot easier to explore the cave this way than it is actually climb up and down all that stuff. <clears throat> what I want to do now is bring you all to the big cave. So this is what he talks about it being a, a um, um, what do you talk about it? as a as a um, Gothic cathedral. Right? This is this is the the area that's surrounding it. Notice the sand here. Um, this is actually not imported sand. This is this cave. This this is the Rio Frio here. This cave actually is cut through the the, the limestone here and has actually reached the granite down below. And so this is actually it's a, a, a limestone cave that has a granite that has a granite base to it. And undoubtedly, this is this is a, a, a massive, massive cave. So we can go inside and, and get some appreciation of the actually I want to show you this really quick um, of the grandeur of this. So if we look up this massive, massive cliff face. These things coming down here are actually tree roots reaching down from several hundred feet above, getting trying to grow down to get into the into the water down below. Now there's the river running through the cave, but up this way, and there's actually a staircase up here today that the, uh, the tour guides have built. This is there's a ledge that runs about halfway through the cave. And Mason there talks about um, the ledge that's here, comes all along here. And then just to give you a sense of scale, There is somebody standing on that ledge right there. And there's me looking up at them. Right? So this is, this is a huge, huge cave. Now Mason talks about there being ceramics all over the ledge. He talks about architectural platforms and, and things like that. He writes in his report that he actually completely destroyed the platform that he excavated, that he, that he found there. Um, but going there today, this, this, this cave is actually open to tourism. And people are going, in, uh, oftentimes they'll stop here 
on their way to the big site of Caracol down south in Belize. And um, there's, I've, I've found maybe 20 pieces of pottery, small like thumbnail sized pieces of pottery in here. Um, so the, 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 the large quantities of ceramics that he talked about being in here, they're, they're no longer there. At least they're not on the surface anymore. So, but there are some ledges in here too that he, that he recovered artifacts from. And again, not knowing he, where his, without any field notes and, and maps, I don't know where his excavations were. I can estimate that his excavation or his platform is somewhere near here because it seems to be the only place that it can be in the cave, just given, given the character of the cave, but I, I don't know for, for certain. Here we can continue. This is the view from the beach. This is the only beach that I um, let my crew go to. Belize has beautiful beaches. This is a different kind of beautiful beach. Um, and there's even swimming here. So you get the, the river flowing through there. And just looking at the cave, this is somebody's headlamp right here to give you an idea of scale again. And you can actually walk through, this is the edge of that ledge, and you can walk through here um, without, without um, up to this point without any, any source of light. There's enough sunlight getting through the entrance there and the other entrance right here that, that you can go through the cave without, without a light. But there's no, the edge, the ledge ends here. And this is just a, uh, actually an undercut ceiling right here. And you could make your way over this way to these um, travertine pools, which Mason does talk about being filled with sediment. Um, we haven't actually excavated one yet to know there's there, but it's really difficult to get through the rest of the cave um, when, you, when you're visiting. And so a lot of the, a lot of the activity is happening at the other entrance. So this is again, just passing through here really quickly. And heading out to the other side, you can see that there's, there's almost no, there's no trail to get into the cave this way. Um, and then of course there's clear shift, sheer cliff faces here. Um, and then a trail that goes out to by, by um, the twin caves. So a lot of, one of the things that Mason talked about in his, his investigations of the caves, the caves A and C, was that in cave A, the other cave that we looked at with the, with the creature, there was a lot of jars. And there's actually still, there's, there's, there's hundreds of rema uh, jar remains in the caves still to this day. He found very few jars in this cave. And in fact, a lot of what he found here were sensors and more um, elaborate pottery. Uh, more uh, painted pottery, polychrome pottery, um, things like that. And so this, we're seeing the, the, the two caves being used for different types of rituals. And I, I haven't been here, I haven't, um, it's sort of questions for future research for this area is, is how are these, how are these um, caves being used differently? Um, certainly I don't have, um, having spent only two seasons there, about a month, we still have a lot, a lot of investigations to do there. And just to show you, this was his cave B that he spent all of one and a half sentences describing. You see this, this big massive entrance here. And it's right, the road to the cave, to the cave C passes just above here. Um, this is the entrance of the cave here. And this is the, the entrance chamber. He said, he, like he said, he found just a few um, undecorated pieces of pottery. And then you go inside and it's a small chamber inside. No dirt floor really to speak of. It's just, it's all bedrock. Um, and so anything that would have been in here is, is if, if the Maya used it much at all, would have been on the surface and was no longer here, or simply they just weren't using this cave because there is um, other, ones, other ones around. All right, so um, let's see. I just want to go back here and, and really quickly talk, uh, and then then I'll I'll end here in just a, in a few minutes. Minute. Um, we we did excavations at the entrance here, um, and we actually found a couple really cool things that help us understand at least 
uh, for now, give us some basic idea of what was happening in the entrance of Cave A. I haven't really worked with Cave C yet just because uh, it's a tourist cave and there's people there pretty much every day. So I don't want to ruin the tourist experience. And also um, uh, have an excavation in the right in the middle of the tourist path through the cave would, would not be good. Um, but we have done some excavations here. And what we've uncovered, this is actually pretty common in this part of Belize, is part of a plaster floor that actually, um, we caught the, the edge of it. So it likely actually extends out into um, further on into this into this part of the cave here as well. And we did find some um, human remains under there. And so we know that rock shelters like this were commonly used as burial places for, for um, by the Maya. And so it may be that this is this is um, there may be there may be more burials here um, or, or or not. Um, we, we don't know enough yet to, to say either way. Um, but in, in we, we dug two units here, and the other really cool thing that we found in both units was immature corn cobs. So we have baby corn. <laughs> and so what does this mean? What, what we know is that many agricultural people in the past performed what, what are, can be recalled as uh, first fruit rituals meaning they're, they're the, the first harvest of the season that are given to the, to the earth spirits in order to thank them for, for the successful harvesting for the plants that are growing. Right? And so it's, it, with, with, we've got about five cobs, a piece of cobs here from the two units. And it seems like the entrance of the cave here was, was because of the size of the corn, was, was used for first fruit ceremonies. And so there is some agricultural ritual being performed, uh, being performed here, it looks like. All right, my last question. Who is using the caves? Now, go back. I'm not going to put, put the PowerPoint. I'll just go through this really quickly. So there's no closed surface sites to the cave. Uh, Rio Frio Cave C is um, right, uh, right about here, right underneath the cursor here. So there's no sites nearby. We're looking at the closest site being about 20 kilometers or uh, 10 kilometers away across the river. So sites are far away, and again, nobody's nobody's spent time working here um, because there's there's not supposed to be anything. This brings me to Cave E, and my ill-fated attempt to find it. Um, turns out that the the description of the, the the cave was excavated as a salvage project over the course of a few days, and. The commissioner of archaeology passed away, who, who'd done the work, passed away before he was able to publish it. And a colleague of his who had visited the cave one time published the results for him. There's a bunch of other stuff that happened. Int data was destroyed. Artifacts were lost um, thanks to hurricanes and things like that. Um, and so we have a, a real piecemeal report uh, on the excavations at Cave E, and it's primarily a ceramics report. Uh, the cave, The cave is not the, the location of the cave is, is, is very, very general in the report. It just says it's to, uh, several miles from, from uh, the forestry depot nearby. And so we went to find it. And um, it, was, it was rough. It was a really rough day. I was out of water by 1030. And we got back to the vehicles at 6. I'll tell you what kind of rough day it was. Um, definitely got turned around. Definitely got lost back there. Um, but as we were passing through, let's see if I can my pictures. Um, this looks like a picture. Okay, as we were passing through the area, We came across agricultural terraces. We came across some, a couple of pl small plazas with cut stone. And the coolest thing we came across was a stela. Now, stela are things of royalty, right? Um, so we, we, 
unfortunately, this is two days before my field season ended and then COVID happened. So we don't really know much about what's what's going on back there, um, except there is there is there does seem to be some settlement back there. Um, but we don't know anything else about it because we haven't been able, been able to get back to investigate it. So this is this is a 3D model of the steel that that um, we're able to put together. It's, it would have been about a meter and a half tall. It's made out of slate, which is unusual in the Maya region. Um, and we did flip it over, and it is uncarved, so it doesn't have any hieroglyphic text on it. Um, but it is it is in a plot in one of the plazas that we that we found. So. Uh, I've spent 22 years being a cave archaeologist, and the last two days of one of my last field seasons, I have apparently become a settlement archaeologist. So, um, with that, I think I've gone way over my time. So, I'm going to go ahead and end there, and I'll, um, I guess we will open up the floor for Q&A. Thanks, Dr. Spinard. This has been fascinating, and I've got I, I already have a couple questions just on my own. So, uh, the those little corn cobs were they burned? Yes. Yeah, they were. They were um, charcoal. Like an offering or something like that. Yep. Yeah. The, there was actually in the um, in the excavation unit there was a there it was large large chunks of charcoal all throughout the all throughout the the, um, the unit the surface of the unit it was a really heavily burned area of the cave. And let's see, Jim says, can you talk a bit about the indigenous involvement and the responses to excavation of human remains in cave A? What did you do with the human remains? Um, so they're, they are, they're in, in the lab right now. Um, we, um, we actually, uh, the, um, the Maya people that I work with um, are not, they're not a descendant community. Uh, when, when Belize was, a, when, when the sites of Belize were abandoned, uh, many of the many of the communities moved away, and and the Maya many of the Maya in this this area believes um, the village I work with are um, they actually they're refugees of the caste war of the 1800s, and so they they the the community talks about moving down in the early 1900s, and so they don't actually they're they're not they don't see these as ancestral remains, um, but there was still um, um, Javi who's my who I've been working with for for over a decade now. Um, we actually, we, we, um, he made an offering for us to, to thank the cave and, and to, um, you know, to, to uh, basically uh, uh, appease the spirit of the hill and also of the, of the remains. Um, something else though, when it comes to human remains in, in the Maya area, what we actually see is that in many cases there, um, the bones are often used as, as offerings and it doesn't seem to be the, 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 the spirit of the person is usually in the skull, not in the other bones. And so we, we do see Maya people using bones of, of the deceased in other offerings and other contexts that, that aren't burials. And so we don't, we don't know the context of this yet. It was actually, um, it was a, um, we had, we recovered a, 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 the sternum, not the sternum, the, um, the tailbone. And that that's it. So we don't, we don't know we, we don't know the context of whether this is a burial or or some other kind of offering. Thanks. Uh, Leslie wanted to know if you sent in any of those corn cobs for radiocarbon dating. They are stuck with the bones from Domingo Ruiz <laughs> down in Belize. So not yet, but they're definitely they're definitely going to be they're definitely going to be dated. Oh, she says no. <laughs> I, I know it's it's. Hello, uh, Ranchuran here from Belize. Hi. Yeah, I'm I'm with the Ministry of Tourism doing a project with science for the area. I was reading your report. Uh, it's actually two reports in one. On the second report, I saw a map, and I was trying because I, I've, I'm visiting the area and trying to put some some science. Um, what I see on your map, the rear of, rear of cave C, uh -huh. where it has the arrow, it, it is depicted above the Rio Frio River. Is that correct? 
The way I understand it is that the, is the Rio Frio River flows into the cave and comes yeah. out. Yes. Yes. Um, but, are, which report are you looking at? Are you looking at um, one of the projects? Your report? first report. Your first report that is on your website. That's how I came about okay. finding this this lecture because um, I was doing a research on the because like what Pendagra says is terra incognita. So I was trying to find out some information about the area. Mm -hmm. and um, so, yes, but sir. I saw the map. So I'm asking whether the, the cave is outside the river or it's no, just a the, mistake. The, the, cave, the cave flows through the river. Um, or the, sorry, the river. <laughs> the river the flows river through the cave. It, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Let me see if I can pull up a picture here of it again. Oh, here at the very beginning of the talk here. Can you can you see the can you see the PowerPoint? Yeah, I'm seeing the PowerPoint. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So so the river for about 400 meters or so flows through flows through the cave. Yeah. And the cave is right on yeah. the hillside. So yeah. So it, it's um um I, I'll have to look at the I'd have to look at the map. Um, yeah. Again. But I could do I I yeah I could I can send you a I can send it if I probably can get your email or send it through the my contact. Well, yeah, I need a map on what my question more precisely. I, I, I'm having problem with technical difficulties. I'm I'm watching the video on my computer, but listening uh -huh. on my phone. Okay, <laughs> so, a little difficulty. But um, it's very interesting. Like I said, there was no write up on these caves, and um, when I do this type of work, I try to know the area more. I don't want yeah, to make certainly. mistakes on science. Um. So just a couple things. If I just put my address, uh, my email into the chat. If you can, you can okay, say it great. there. Um, and then great. So was... before yes. I started the work in, in 2018, um, the only other research that had been done here was, was um, Mason back in 1928. Yes, so, uh, so yes. there's, there's been no archeology span done, done here. So yeah. um, my report is the most, that report is the most recent, um, the most recent information out there. Yeah, I, 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 I got it that, but the lecture is very interesting. I'm, I read the report, but it's still far more different seeing the, your lecture because you're interpreting it while you, when you read a report, it's just there, you know. Right. Thanks very much for having invited me to this meeting. Glad you can make it. Yeah. Um, Nathan wants to know, what what mistakes or hard lessons did you learn from your field experience uh, that you'd like to share? Um, <laughs> most recently, bring more water. Get a life straw um, because you, you never know where you're going to wind up. <laughs> um, uh, that 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 day that we were out looking for cave E was one of the most miserable days of my life. Um, I, I, it took us a couple of days to recover um, and about three gallons of Gatorade uh, from, from it. And we, we had gotten horrible cramps on the way home. Our whole bodies were cramping up from, from it. So, um, you know, take, take, make sure you take care of yourself and, 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 you know, make sure that your, your health is, is your top priority when you're doing field work. Um, other than that, get a digital camera and, and take the time to take the pictures. Document document everything. Um, the 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 there's more than enough enough memory out there for for pictures of everything and and you know with with the advent of photogrammetry, some of those three D models I was showing you and, and sort of the, the ease of which it can be done now. I go back to even ten years ago to some of the work I was doing and thinking how great it would be if I had just taken a few more pictures of, of a site that I was working at or an excavation unit, that I could just from those few pictures reconstruct the, you know, make a 3D model of it and, and go back to visit it. Like I, like we just visited these caves and, and to be able to study it again in, in its context. And, and so, you know, take, take lots of pictures and take care of yourself. That is, that is a good lesson. <laughs> Does anyone um, else have any questions? Kind yeah. Of questions? I have a, a suggestion. Um, as a local, I see a lot of people go to the forest with short pants, short sleeves. I, as a local, I go with long sleeves and long pants. 
the reason behind it is because you have a lot of insects. You don't know which type of insect might bit you, bite you. So I always suggest you always take long sleeves and long pants. Um, but most uh, tourists and foreigners as a whole like to come to the jungle and wear short pants and short sleeve, and that's a no-no for me. Just a, as a local, I am putting this into the, the team. Another good point to wear long sleeves and long pants, even when you're in the jungle. Especially when you're in the jungle. <laughs> Does anyone else have any other questions? Oh, no? going once. Um, just since I'm interested in this topic, um, when are you coming back after COVID? <laughs> yeah, as soon as I can. <laughs> once, once, once the airport opens up, I'll be there. I hope. Um, but and I, then you said, excuse me. Then you said you. This is your second visit. Well, I, I, th for this project, um, this is uh, last 2019 was my second season there. But I, I was working yeah. at Park Betune. Um, oh, Park Betune, yes. uh, yeah. yeah. That's at the so entrance I, I, of the, the Tripitra Junction before you enter our, um, MPR. Yep. No, why, why I ask? Because I, I only read one report. Do you have a second report? Yep. Just for... um, it's actually, it, it was held up um, because of COVID. Okay. Um, I just actually okay, just okay. sent it down to the Institute today or this, that, this week and it should be there next week. Um, and okay. once, once they get it, I, I will, I'll post the second report that I have. Great, great. Looking forward for that. Thanks very much once again. You're welcome. Well, Thank you, everybody. If you want to unmute or put your video on and sit, wave and clap and say thank you very much, Dr. Spinard. Um, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Good job. Thanks. I'm having pro technical problems, so I can't post my. my <laughs> let me see if I can. <laughs> no, I'm having technical problems. Sorry about that. I'm using a computer and a phone. <laughs> <laughs> thank you john okay You're thank welcome. you john thank you everybody I, I appreciate i appreciate the support we're, we're all here you just can't yeah. hear us and you're talking to a quiet room so i want to give everybody a chance to to yeah. make some noise and say yeah. hello and we're, we're all out here for you yeah. yes we are yeah thank you yeah. Yeah. Thank you, john. awesome Thank you, John. Love you, John. <laughs> so, so thanks everybody. Um, we'll post we'll get this posted soon on our on our YouTube channel and um, we'll have a link to it on the website. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Spinard, and it was really interesting and very exciting. Yeah. And we want to know what happens with that Stila. Yeah. I, I, I can't wait either, I'll tell you. I mean, I can't imagine that you're just walking through the jungle and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, wait, what? Like, <laughs> this is a thing. These are not just rocks. This is like a thing. This is a thing. And it, it must have been I, I very promise, I promise you I won't do like Mason. I, I will keep, leave it to the experts. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Awesome job, John. Yeah, good job, yeah, John. Awesome job, Professor. So you are you are free to go. Everyone likes to go. You are free to go. Bye. Great job. Bye, John. Bye, John. Bye, everybody. Thanks for staying up, ladies, coasters. <laughs> um, let me stop sharing the screen. And you're getting you're getting a lot of kudos here, Dr. Spinard. Oh, awesome. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions. I know most people just logged off, but um. If anybody has any more questions, I'm, I'm happy to happy to answer them. Or if everybody wants to go, that's fine too. <laughs> I think everyone's. Oh no, we've got 13 people still hanging out. If anyone else has any more questions, anyone, anyone. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Natalie. I'm gonna go ahead and go ahead and log off. Um, it was nice to meet you, and maybe I guess we won't see you at Ark in the Park because no, be. I know it is going to be all virtual, not yeah. virtual, online. Oh, no, no. 
Um, but yeah, I, I appreciate it. And I'm glad we could finally connect and things calm down enough for you to be able to put a presentation together. <laughs> I know it's been, it's been, it's been wild. Yeah. Yeah, it has. So. That's it's for fun. sure. It was good. This is good to, 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 to do this and I really enjoyed it. So thanks again. Thank you very much. And you do get, you do get a free membership for a year for the, to the society, cool. um, which at this point means you get the newsletter. <laughs> Wonderful. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. And it's been great. Yep. Have, Have a good night. night. Take care. Bye-bye.